Chris Lee, Blake Lovell, and Blaine Gilmer here to continue our preview series of Southeastern Conference football teams for the 2023 football season. Today we get to the Texas A&M Aggies. And, and Blake, is there any drama with Texas A&M heading into this season? Listen, if you think there's going to be drama, I would like to point you to Southeastern 14 on YouTube where – one Blaine Gilmer recently did a video on whether there's going to be drama involving Jimbo Fisher and Bobby Petrino. And so I'm not going to answer that question, Chris, I'm going to let Blaine answer that in his video. And we're just going to plug that thing cheap plug here for this other video, but I'm sure we'll talk about the dynamic of course, between Jimbo and Petrino and all that. But, um, Hey, we'll see. I mean, this is, you know, I think as some Texas A&M fans have, have said, and I've seen this on social media, it can't get much worse than it got, for a large stretch of last season. And I agree with that. I don't think it's going to be what it was a season ago. Um, I think it will be much better and how much better. That's the question for me. So. Yeah. And for all the deal about, you know, two recruiting classes ago, how historic that was and how Texas A&M took advantage of the NIL opportunities when it opened up and all of those things that have happened, you know, there was a, a little bit of an exodus there, uh, some players players leaving and things like that. But when you look at it, it's surprising that the returning production, and we'll get into specifics of that, returning production is rather high for Texas A&M on both sides of the ball. Actually, one of the higher ones in all of college football. So this is a team that returns a lot. Uh, that's the good news and the bad news, right? Because they have, didn't have a year that they wanted. But the good news is that uh, they feel like – uh, Blake and I were talking even before this that Jimbo Fisher kept pointing towards, hey, next year, uh, we're really building towards next year and things like that. Well, next year has arrived, so we'll see. And that's what we're here to do is break down the 2023 Texas A&M Aggies, Chris. Yeah, look, if it's a question of talent, I'm not concerned at all. I mean, this is a, a top 10 team in the country. Who knows, maybe top five just based on talent alone. I, I've been – Thinking all off season, this was a slam dunk pick as the number three, and then Jimbo Fisher spoke at media days, <laughs> and the inability to admit he's going to have to give up control of the offense, or you can splice that however you want it. We're not going to get into that night, but we, you know, it's been dissected. That's what concerns me. It's it's really guys. It's not the talent. It's the it's all the other stuff. But let's talk about the talent because we could spend an hour on the other stuff, and we won't. Blaine, I'm going to start with you. Connor Wegman has been a guy you've been extremely high on all off season. Tell us why. When he comes in and in games where it would have been easy for them with the way the season was going, just to kind of, okay, I'm just going to try to throw it in some windows that maybe I know I can't fit it in. He didn't turn the ball over one time during his time playing last year. And that's not easy to do as a true freshman. I don't care how many games it is that you're playing in or, or or starting in. And he only started those last four games and ended up playing in really five there. But Connor Wegman is a guy who Jimbo Fisher referenced it at SEC Media Days. If he'd elected to go baseball full-time, he would have been a really high-round draft pick in baseball. A guy was a, a played shortstop in high school and things like that. And we know in, in in baseball, that's where, you know, one of the more athletic guys is at that shortstop position. He's big guy, physical, can run. And I think we saw that in Jimbo Fisher, in Jimbo Fisher's revamped offense with Bobby Petrino at the helm. We saw the propensity to run Connor Wigman a little bit more, even in the spring, showed off some some power reads, showed off some some zone reads, some design runs for Connor Wigman. And, you know, with a young running back group, that's going to be important. But, Blake, I just saw when, when Connor Wingman came in, I saw more of a tendency to, okay, let that thing loose and go down the field. And they took some more shots than they did before he became the starting quarterback. Yeah, I mean, he looked pretty confident even as a, a young guy. I think sometimes that's hard to do in the SEC is to kind of have that confidence to take those shots. But, you know, you talked about the shortstop aspect i mean the shortstop you got to know where to where to put the ball right like you got to know how to get the ball one place and his quarterback you got to know where to put the ball and i think for him you know the fact is and i know we talked about this last year but you know just not making mistakes and that's always something we bring up and you know for him what was it eight touchdowns to zero interceptions and um you know again you looked at his numbers again that i know that's something blaine talked about towards the end of last season in some of those games and 
Yeah, I mean, they weren't anything that just completely, you know, jumped off the page at you. But at the same time, he he made the plays to put them in that position in what, guys? I mean, literally every game they played in, right? Like, I mean, every game that he was in, he put them in a position to have a chance. And I think that's all you can ask for. Um, and so you would fully expect that now you come into this season, that experience is under your belt. Like Blaine said, I'm very curious to see how they continue to use it more, you know, from a rushing standpoint. And when you put all that together, it's easy to see why he is probably, you know, projected what Blaine, we had him at five, I think in our our top five in terms of quarterback ranking. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's easy to understand why, because he's got all the tools and I think it it all comes back to how he's going to be used and what should be a much, much improved offense because he now has someone else there, not just a Jimbo Fisher, but he has a Bobby Petrino, who we've seen put quarterbacks in a really good position in the past, and I think that makes it pretty exciting to see how they use him. So, well, the other thing he's got play because he's got weapons around him. I mean, he's got they've got a nice Smith, who's one of the top all-purpose guys in the league the last couple of years. They've got Evan Stewart, who's probably on the the very very short list of of top receivers in the SEC. Might might even be the best if you want to argue that. It was a top ten recruit out of high school. Uh, they've got some guys back at running back. Nobody spectacular, but they also brought in Reuben Owens, who is one of the top running backs in, in this class. And we'll get to the line in a minute, but certainly a lot of guy Moose Muhammad, another guy. I knew I was forgetting somebody. A lot of dudes around him who have either produced or have got the potential to produce quite well. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's one of those things where you could look at this group and I know, you know, Blaine brought this up before we started recording, but like even someone like Moose Muhammad is like, he's, he's not even getting talked about that much. Like he's getting talked about, but like not that much, but he's a really good player. And I think when you combine that group together, you know, when you talk about a Stewart and Muhammad, an I Smith coming back, I mean, this is a really, really talented group. And that's why, again, you know, if you're looking as to why this should be such a drastic improvement, not just for the entire team, but specifically for this offense, look at everybody that should be on the field. And you mentioned Owens, too, and just kind of the talent there for a guy like that, um, you know, and having to replace a Devin A. chain. But, I mean, there's there's a lot of options here in this offense. And that's why I think, you know, again, I think excitement is the word because, you want to see how exciting this offense can be with Bobby Petrino there with Connor Wegman. Now we're having another kind of, you know, a season under his belt, all these playmakers returning. And, you know, you've got a lot of guys there that I think can really give them that breakaway game changing playability. Like they have multiple guys on this offense that can do that. And uh, we know how important that is in the sec. So, yeah, I mean, it's, nothing but positives for me uh, to to this point, because you just, you talk about what they have and it's hard not to just be wowed by the potential, especially I think with this wide receiver group. And I mean, to Blake's point and and even you kind of accidentally made the point I'm going to make Chris by saying, Oh, I kind of forgot Moose Muhammad there at the end. That's the thing. People are forgetting about this young man, 38 receptions, 610 yards, 16.1 yards per reception and he made contested catches in the end zone showed some physicality he's got that nfl pedigree i think moose muhammad and i'm going to do a video on this so make sure you subscribe to the channel i'm going to do a video on the some of the most underrated offensive players in the 2023 season he's on that list he's a guy that does not get enough recognition and if you go look at the media uh, how they voted for all SEC receivers. They put Anaya Smith as a uh, SEC receiver, but Evan Stewart didn't get recognition on the first, second, or third team. And he is a guy who, like you said, Chris, I think he is a bona fide number one, maybe one of the more electric receivers in the league. So Connor Wegman has two studs on the outside at Mr. Do It Everything and Anaya Smith. Jimbo Fisher said that they could. Will probably like likely use him in the backfield a good bit this year, catching passes out of the backfield, carrying it from time to time because they are trying to break in some new backs uh, back there and, and work, figure out what that rotation is going to look like. Talented tight end room as well. Connor Wigman has all the pieces he needs to have success. Yeah, and a footnote here, and I don't know if this was true or not, but we were at media days. We had ballots to vote on teams. Evan Stewart, I think, certainly would have been on my list. I didn't get my ballot in on time, but I remember I was going through the voting process, and there would be guys on there. You had to be nominated by your team. 
Uh, and and oh, if wow. you weren't, you, you saw some guys that were conspicuously absent. I'm wondering if yeah. that was the case with Evan Stewart. Because, I had no, uh, he was on there, yeah. Chris. I, I had him was very he? high on my list. I don't remember exactly okay. where I had him, but he was he was on there. I was surprised he wasn't um yeah involved but maybe not you know what now that i think about it maybe he wasn't on there but i i don't know i don't want to say with that with any authority because for some reason i'm I'm pretty sure i remember having pretty high on my list but i don't know how he didn't make that group so yeah because i I didn't realize that either i'm thinking i I don't know how evan stewart wasn't on somebody's first team all sec or second uh unless it was something like that and you, you like again you did see some like you know georgia and alabama didn't list quarterbacks i don't think um among other things. And so you, you saw uh, Vanderbilt didn't put its best player, C.J. Taylor, on there. Uh, so you, oh, you yeah. saw some strange things, and I'm wondering if that was one of them. But offensive line guys, a was recruited really well. Uh, Blaine, I, I guess I'll start with you here. Um, they got three guys that had about 700 snaps or more a year ago. Leighton Robinson's, I think, a, another all-league guy. I don't know where he finished on the, on the ballot, but he, he should have been high up there. They've got a lot of guys that have played some ball and some talented dudes waiting in the wings uh, to get experience here, too. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it starts in the middle there with, with Bryce Foster. He's a guy who does track. He does shot put uh, at, at Texas A&M as well and, and has a lot of success in that. And, you know, now he brings kind of that just that that toughness you need in the middle and something that I think Texas A&M – desperately needs kind of that identity around Bryce Foster. But you mentioned Layden Robinson, big guy, experienced guy uh, there at the guard position. So I think that they're going to be fine on the on the offensive line. Of course, you always need depth. Uh, and, you know, even there, they've got some guys that are returning for, you know, second, third year in the program back behind the, the starting group. They have Chase Basantis, a – talented talented freshman coming in that could contribute at some point at either tackle position uh he's a guy out of the state of new jersey that they went head to head with georgia for and ended up winning that recruiting battle so there as we continue to say the pieces are there you know and as you know it's it's biblical to who much is given much is much is required right and that is where we're at with Texas A&M and uh, the the repercussions could be old testament biblical for Jimbo Fisher if it doesn't get done this year because i'm just telling you the the talent is there on this offensive side of the ball we haven't got fully to the tight end room but that's probably where you're going next this tight end room in addition to a big experienced physical offensive line this tight end room I would venture to say you go and look at the guys there, what they've done, what they're capable of. It may be the second best tight end room in the entire SEC behind that of Georgia. Well, but I'm just curious as you, as you read your Bible recently, was was the figure ninety million dollars dropped anywhere? I'm just curious how specific we we got. There Jimbo the has his testament. Jimbo Jimbo uh, has a lot of money. He's got like King Solomon money over there, you know. So they built him a temple. No doubt. All right. Uh, yeah, we'll get – we better move on before we get struck by lightning here. Um, Blaine, do you have anything to add to the offensive line or, or to our discussion of the Old Testament here? I mean, I, uh, I know you said Blaine, but I know you are talking about me. But um, yeah, I'm so flustered that I, I got I was, the wrong name. Yes. I didn't know if you'd call me by a biblical name maybe. But, um, <laughs> I mean, look, you can't preview SEC football without, you know, getting into the, the biblical phrases and such. So, no, I have, I have nothing else to add. Um, I <laughs> I have nothing else to add at the moment after that. He says so. amen and move on. Let's there go. you go. So were, were horn frogs one of the plagues, I believe? Maybe. Horn oh frogs. <laughs> the, off, the offensive line will be better. That's all I got. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Get us out of this mess. Uh, other side of the line of scrimmage, defensive line. My goodness. a and has got four guys that were national top 15 recruits. Shamar Turner, Shamar Stewart. Walter Nolan, who was the number one player in the whole class last year. Um, Brownlow Dendy was another one. Um, David Hicks, I guess there's five of them, actually. I mean, it's it's crazy how much talent these guys have got here. McKinley Jackson was a top 100 recruit who's played well in this league. I mean, guys, if, if it starts in the trenches, uh, then our discussion starts in College Station, I think, in terms of teams at the top of the heap. 
Yeah, Fad- and Fadil Diggs is a guy who's kind of that tweener role. Sometimes he's a stand-up, sometimes he's handing the dirt. But LT Overton is a guy who reclassified, jumped up, didn't even play his senior. He, he reclassified uh, and joined Texas A&M's class and was a freshman last year at Texas A&M when he was supposed to be a senior in high school. So, you know, he's just coming into his own now. They have – they are loaded – they have six guys, as you mentioned, that you can really count on between LT Overton, Fidel Diggs, Walter Nolan, McKinley Jackson, and both Shamar, Shamar Turner and Shamar Stewart, that everybody in the country wanted. Jimbo's got him. I went back and watched uh, Texas A&M versus LSU last year, and the way that that front four was able to control the LSU run game and force them, force them to try to get the ball out quickly as well because they were doing a lot of stunts and bringing pressure and things like that Blake if they can concoct that recipe early on in the season and being able to have guys like Walter Nolan play up to his potential be there and now that he's a sophomore and he's been there Fidel Diggs really have a, a year where hey he's getting ready to go to the league things like that then you're looking at a totally different Texas A&M bunch with if they can control a really good offensive line like they did with LSU last year. Yeah, I think the, like you said, sort of finishing the season the way they did is important because if you look at the overall numbers, right, they weren't good in terms of ability to stop the run and, um, or were they 122, I think, in, in rush defense last year. And obviously that's an area they've got to get better. But I think it goes back to what we talked about kind of with the offense too. I think just the, the added year of experience helps um, some of these guys in particular. And like you said, just the talent that's there, um it's undeniable i mean it it is like you can't deny the talent across the board like you said you can go from from Diggs, overton jackson and so forth to turner and stewart like you just keep going down the line and yes like that's why you can look at this group and kind of feel the same way where what they're the top passing defense i think statistically last season obviously rush wise that they they were not i know we'll talk about kind of the the back part of the defense in a second but um Yeah, I mean, it's like, man, when we go down this list, I think you just keep having the same thing, right? It's just improvement. And I think you're seeing that as you get into this part in terms of this front part of the defense, they're going to be better. They're going to be improved. And it's hard to see how they're not just from a a talent standpoint. Again, just kind of using that experience last year, like Blaine said, specifically looking at that LSU game and how sort of you finish the season. Um, I think there's a lot you can take away from that and feel pretty good about where you are heading in this season. Well, they feel pretty good when they look at the back seven, too. The defensive backfield is where they get a lot of attention. I'll get to that momentarily. But they got Chris Russell Jr. returning to start at middle linebacker, where he was very productive a year ago. Edron Cooper also returns. Those guys are class of 19, class of 2020. They've been around, played a ton of ball. So starting linebackers back. The secondary is going to be one of the best in the country. I, I Damani Richardson, I wasn't sure how he had any eligibility left or isn't in the league yet, but he's back. I, I'm guessing he's the headliner. Um, you know, Tyreek Chappell's played a lot of ball in this league, played pretty well. Well, actually, I hadn't played a lot of ball. He was a first-year guy a year ago, but started and played a lot. Um, they transferred a couple ACC transfers, guys. Sam yeah. McCall from Florida State, and maybe more notably Josh DeBerry from Boston College, who was a really productive corner. I, I'm not sure if he was maybe honorable mention or one of the lower-level all-ACC teams at some point when he was there, but he played a lot of ball and I think brought home some, some honors with him too. I think Texas a and expected to be – is it fair to say one one of the top secondaries in the league? And again, when you add linebackers to that, they're in really good shape. Yeah, they added Tony Grimes from North Carolina as well, who who could end up who could end up and probably will be one of their starting corners. He's a he's a physical guy. He's also yet again, Chris, another guy on this <laughs> defense that he was at North Carolina, of course, last year, but he was a guy who reclassified. Okay, didn't play his senior year of high school, jumped into playing in North Carolina a year early, learned the ropes over there, the ACC. Now he is here at at College Station playing. And between him and Sam McCall, Josh DeBerry, they really fortified that corner position. They had some guys like Denver Harris and people like that move out to LSU and, and other places. 
listen, there's sometimes there's a, addition by subtraction, things like that, because with some of these places that you see, no, they don't have the, maybe the proven depth behind the starters, but they have gotten who they feel like in talking to Jimbo, people who are going to be more bought into the system, people who are going to have a better kind of influence on the locker room. And we've said it, every position, talent, 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 talent. It was more of the off the field stuff and more of the culture stuff that got Ella, got uh, Texas A&M in trouble last year and maybe had some dissension and things like that. And then all the drama gets going after an App State loss and even more with, uh, you know, people getting on Jimbo about play calling and all of this stuff. But on the defensive side of the ball, they should be very solid. And getting Damani Richardson, as you said, to come back, who many people thought would be a, you know, first three round draft pick last year. He was he was slated to go to the league. He decides to come back for another year. Adds leadership. He's one of their their tougher players on the team. So Blake, I think that's tremendous in terms of the the leadership and the culture aspect, something that Texas AM really needed to put a band-aid on after last year. Yeah, and you got some older guys who can kind of carry that that leadership part of it too. And I think that's again always something nice to have. Just just experience and some of these older guys in this part of the defense and yeah, I mean, the word that comes to mind for me is just options. I mean, you think about the names we just mentioned and all these different guys and, um, you know, bringing over the ACC group, and um, it just gives you options, and it gives you a lot of, you know, guys to turn to in, in this part of the defense. So, yeah, I mean, like Chris said, I think this will easily be one of the best groups in the SEC um, in this department and, again, could be nationally as well, just given how much talent's there um, in this secondary for sure. Special teams, quickly, guys, uh, they, they've added, let's see, they've got Randy Bond back. Um, they, they've got Evan Stewart and I Smith in the return game. Those guys would be excellent. Uh, Nick Constantino, one of their, their punter, is an All-American candidate. I mean, they, they'll be really good there, too. They will. And, you know, on the returners, one of them listed is, is Ruben Owens. Didn't really talk much about him in the running back group because this running back group is so young, but I did want to circle back around to that real quick. I wouldn't be surprised if by the end of the year, Ruben Owens ends up starting for Texas A&M. That's how talented that young man is. He's an unbelievable player from the state of Texas. They were able to keep him home. They were able to win a head-to-head -head battle over Texas for him. Uh, Georgia was in on him. Oklahoma was in on him, and they keep him there. Uh, he gets to go you know, and compete with other guys, Daniels and Moss there, but he could end up being big in that return game as well if they if they so choose to go down that path, Chris. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the schedule a minute. And we had a separate video about that, but I think it's, it's worth repeating here because I just think that how they start determines a lot of stuff. Now, look, layup first week. Return trip to Miami, A&M should be the better team in that one. A&M won the game a year ago. Uh, that, that's hardly been an intimidating environment in Coral Gables recently. Uh, you know, so – or Miami Gardens, I guess, as it is for football. But we'll see how that one goes. ULM layup week three. Auburn week four. Again, I, I've said this a million times. I'd rather catch Auburn early than late. A&M gets that luxury. It's also at home. The Arkansas game. In Arlington should be a good one, and then you got that stretch: Alabama, Tennessee. Uh, my goodness, if if AM is five and zero heading into that Alabama game, can you imagine the hype that's going to be around this? And not to mention the, the the game to Tennessee. I don't know when the last time they played in Knoxville was, uh, but the, the, that right there, smack in the middle of schedule. Uh, I just think that's going to be one of the most intriguing storylines potentially in college football this year is those back to back games. Yeah, that, that'll be that'll be very interesting. I, let's not discount how crazy that game in Arlington always is. It, it's always just a roller coaster of events and emotions that goes through that game. Something a weird bounce of ball happens, and one team takes over. Things like that. Maybe the team that you think has more of the momentum going in doesn't play as well. That's happened in this rivalry recently as well. Going to be a really good a matchup of two really good quarterbacks, a more experienced guy in KJ Jefferson, and then the gunslinger uh, Connor Wegman with Bobby Petrino. Uh, do they come off of a big win at Kyle Field leading into that Arkansas game? That beating Auburn early is going to be crucial here because they do have every opportunity, Blake, to be. 
four and zero, oh, and then that that middle stretch there is is brutal. But you know, hey, you get the bye week after that, and you get that just storied tradition of the crossover game against South Carolina that makes absolutely no sense. That I am so happy is going to be going away after this year. But I digress. You can take what's your thoughts on the schedule, Blake? Well, uh, yeah, uh, that's unfortunate um, that that game will not be played regularly every season. Um, here's my only hesitation. We, we talk about how much better they're going to be, and and, and I'm in agreement. I, I think they're going to be significantly better. But if you take the Alabama game out and say that could potentially be the toughest game on the schedule, and that's at home. It's a great place to be, right? But I think the next – the five toughest opponents after that are all away from home um, If you if you count – you say at Miami, Arkansas, and Arlington, which again is not a true road game, but it's it's away from Kyle Field. Miami, Arkansas, at Tennessee, at Ole Miss, at LSU. So that to me is where it that's why this start is so important, is because you know, you're going to play your toughest games away from home this year. Like that's just the way the schedule sets up. Again, assuming, and this is all we can do right now. We can assume Tennessee is going to be really good. We can assume Ole Miss is going to be good. LSU is going to be good. Um, we'd be surprised if those teams are not. And who knows? Maybe a South Carolina winds up being a top 25 team. Maybe maybe a, a Mississippi State does later in the season. I don't know. Um, but I think that's the only thing right now is you're going to have to be much improved to, I think, navigate the schedule because, again, most of the t- I think most of the toughest opponents you have on the schedule are not going to be playing at Kyle Field. And that's where I think having a, a mentally strong quarterback like a Connor Wegman that's a year older, and I just think that's really going to you know pay, pay dividends for them with a schedule like this and having all those playmakers too that can change a game sort of a moment's notice with all the guys we've talked about. All right, parting thoughts on the Aggies. Blake, I'll start with you. Well, as we brought up before, what's the stat? I think five of their seven losses last year by by six points or less. Um, they beat LSU. They should have beat Alabama, all things considered. They should have won that game, as we talked about before. Um, you know, they're still going to rely on underclassmen, I think, in you know, in multiple areas, and we've talked about that. But at the same time, it is improvement all across the board, I think. Um, you know, maybe you can say, well, this one position here, but that goes back. I mean, that's the theme. It's improvement. And I think having more experience sometimes can just do the mathematical mathematical equation. More experience equals more wins. And I think when you're as talented as they are, when you combine all that stuff together, I just think that's what's going to happen. And as Blaine said earlier, Jimbo said they were a year away last year. He kept pointing to this year. This year is here. They have to deliver. If they don't, um, you know, they, they could be setting up as the most disappointing team in the, in the country for a second straight season. But quite frankly, I just don't see that happening. I think they put all the pieces in place. And even with a tough schedule, um, I think they figure it out and, and really turn things around. And yeah, the old joke used to be that August 4th was Texas A&M Day because it was 8-4 and they always go 8-4. and four. So, listen, Texas A&M fans would love to see 8-4, and 9-3 and three this year because I think that would be a trend in the right direction, especially with how tough that schedule is. As Blake said, I think they're very capable of reaching that. And I believe, unlike a lot of people, I did the video of why it will work and why it won't work. I found a lot more reasons why it will work when I was diving into it because I think Bobby Petrino is that good of a play caller. And I think Jimbo, even with the frustrating answers he may have gave the media on SEC Media Days, he knows what is needed for this team and this program. And I think he genuinely is going to enjoy working with Bobby Petrino. It's still going to be a collaborative effort, but I think he's really going to enjoy working with him because there was a lot on his plate as the play caller and the head coach with the way college football is today. I think you're going to see a Mark, I mean, a remarkable jump forward in this offense. Connor Wegman, I think one of the more underrated wide receiver groups in the country. I think Texas A&M's offense takes the next step this year. Yeah, to me, and, and not to reiterate too much, but it, it's it's about all that other stuff. How do they manage the offensive coordinator slash play calling stuff? How do they manage the the weight of of expectations if they're say five and zero heading into to Alabama? How do they manage 
uh, the weight of disappointment if, they're, say, they're three and two headed into Alabama. I just think so much pressure has built up at every turn uh, for all the reasons everybody knows. I, I'm just, I think any way you slice it, this is a program that's going to be under a microscope. Uh, how they handle that is going to be everything because, look, you said eight and four, they might be happy with that. Well, I'll tell you what, this is a team that, that you could look up at the end of the year and say, hey, eight and four, they might not should have been happy with because they could have been a double-digit win team. That The talent is there. It's all in that other stuff. We'll see how they handle it. And we'll be here to cover it. Uh, we cover SEC football, baseball, and basketball wall-to-wall. Best way to get that, hit that subscribe button, enable your notifications so you're aware when we put up new content. Hit the like button. That helps our analytics. And, and tell some friends. Uh, let's help build our channel. We've only been around – doing this for not even really two years. And, and so we've grown quickly as, as people have discovered us. All right. For Blake Lovell and Blaine Gilmer, I'm Chris Lee of Southeastern 14. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again more with SEC football content. 